Hello, good evening. I'm Lauren Mackler. I'm one of the curators of Made in LA 2020, which is currently on view at the Hammer Museum, um, as well as at the Huntington Library Art Museum and Botanical Gardens. Made in LA 2020 is the fifth iteration of the Hammer Museum Biennial, and it was co-curated by Miriam Ben Salah, Aike Onyewenyi, and me. The show is up until August 1st, so I hope you have a chance to see it. I'm really thrilled to welcome you to tonight's biennial related program organized by Made in LA 2020 artist, Hedy L. Colty. Um, and this is a part of a series of programs that we're doing with Hedy throughout the summer. This program is titled M as in Malady and comprises a reading by writer Dodie Bellamy and a screening of three short films, which I'll tell you about in just a moment. First, I'll give you a brief introduction to Hedy. So Hedy El Colti was born in Rabat, Morocco, raised in Casablanca and moved to Los Angeles in the early 1990s by way of Paris. His work encompasses collage, writing, curating, and film programming. And he's also a co-editor of the famed Semiotext Press here in LA alongside Chris Krauss and Sylvain Lautranger. Hedy's collage work brings together a wide range of materials from mainstream culture to obscure references in film, literature, and art to make unsettling juxtapositions. The collages present materials that is familiar, made strange through their collision with each other. At the museum, you'll find Hedy's collage work as a stack of takeaway posters in the galleries, also as a blow up, um, also blown up into a wall sized mural um, at the Hammer. And his work is also featured in the pages of our catalog for which he made a new collection of his collages, an artist book within the book in the spirit of the zines through which he usually distributes his images and writing. This idea of juxtaposing cultural content is something that recurs in Hetty's work on the page, but also in his film programming. And that becomes really clear in tonight's program. Tonight's program restages an evening from a film series, um, film screening series that Hetty ran from 2007 to 2009 at the Mandrake Bar. The series is based on Gilles Deleuze from A to Z by journalist Claire Parnet, which is an intimate documentary interview of her lover, the philosopher Gilles Deleuze, in the last years of his life. In the film, they discuss a series of philosophical concepts, each one evoked by a letter of the alphabet. And in Hedy's series, he pairs each letter segment with a curated roster of rarely seen films. In M as in Malady, he combines an excerpt or the M excerpt, the letter M excerpt from Gilles Deleuze's interview with two powerful works centered around leopard colonies. The first is L'Ordre by Jean-Daniel Paulet, and the second is The House is Black by Iranian filmmaker Farou Farouksad. This screening was presented at the Mandrake Bar first um, in LA, and then again in New York a year later in 2009 um, by writer Chris Krauss. For that iteration of the screening, Chris wrote program notes, which we've made available on the Hammer website as an introduction to tonight's program. This screening encourages a meditation on illness, alienation, fragility, and death, leading us to question the qualities that humanize and dehumanize individuals when confronted to their own mortality. I should say that this screening was, obviously based on its dates, conceived of pre-pandemic, and Hetty proposed it to us as a program before the COVID-19 crisis. And that's interesting because the subjects ultimately are that they're the subjects of the films are ultimately perennial and enduring. Tonight's screening is preceded by a reading. Writer Dodie Bellamy will be reading the namesake essay from her book, When the Sick Rule the World. And I'll introduce Dodie now. So Dodie Bellamy is a novelist, a poet, an essayist. She has published many books and a handful of chapbooks specializing in genre bending work that focuses to quote her on feminism, sexuality, cultural artifacts, both high and low and all things queer. 
From 2018 to 2019, she was the subject of the CCA Wattis Institute for Contemporary Arts On Our Mind program, which is a year-long series of public events, commissioned essays, and reading groups that were inspired um, by her work. In 2015, Semiotex published uh, the book that we are talking about tonight, When the Sick Rule the World, which was or is her third collection of memoir essays. A new collection of her essays titled Be Reaved will be published by Semiotex and distributed by MIT Press later this year. So now I'll hand it over to Dodi to do the reading. Hi, I'm reading from the title piece of my first Semiotex text collection, When the Sick Rule the World. The wall of questions makes me feel devastated and hopeless. I have lived and worked and gone to so many bad places. The naturopath is young, small and blonde and has a little girl's voice. Based on my answer, she says, you are very sick. Your apartment is making you sick. You have to move. She's ordered lots of lab work on me, but she hasn't gotten back any of the results. If I were to move, I asked her, what should I look for? She stares back at me, confused and suspicious, like it were a trick question. Finally, she says, you can move. I know you can move. Many patients have moved and they felt so much better. If you don't move, you'll never get better. But what kind of place should I move to? She says to look on the internet. There's lots of information online. I join a listserv for the sick and learn that the monthly meeting of the sick is happening the following weekend. It takes place in a non-toxic apartment building in San Rafael, built especially for the sick. No fragrances are allowed in the building. Those attending the meeting must use fragrance-free soap, lotion, shampoo, hair conditioner, gel, deodorant, laundry detergent. No fabric softener, no clothes that have been dry cleaned. I already do most of this, but my hair products and body lotion have herbal oils in them. So I spend $30 on fragrance-free versions. I enjoy the ritual of carefully bathing and dressing myself in preparation for my entry into the realm of the sick. The fragrance-free shampoo makes my scalp itch. So I rub on some locally made stone crushed extra virgin olive oil. Driving across the Golden Gate Bridge, I imagine a spa atmosphere, a peaceful wood, wooden hued paradise. The crisp air supercharged with oxygen. Wood hewn. Oh. Instead, I find boxy, institutional white. In the courtyard, a frail, frizzy haired woman stops me from entering the community room. You have to be sniffed first, she says, as she places her nose right up to my body and takes deep, noisy sniffs. I smell something, she says. She moves her nose along my arms and shoulders. No, I don't think it's your sweater. She moves her nose across my head. It's your hair. Do you smell anything, she says to a large-breasted woman. Yes, says the large-breasted woman. It's in her hair. It's giving me a headache. The frail woman tells me I have to cover my hair. But I did everything you asked, I say. She steps into an apartment and returns with two cotton scarves, a green one and a black one. They're those hanky scarves that hippies used to wear and gay men put in their pockets to announce what sex kink they're into. It's just olive oil, I plead. You're giving me brain fog, the large-breasted woman replies. The other woman holds out the scarves. Which one do you want? I take the green one, fold it into a triangle, put it over my head and tie it in the back. Some of your hair is hanging out, I'm told. Put on the other one too. So I wrap the black one around the back of my head and tie it on top above my forehead. The women joke that I look like Aunt Jemima. Most sick experience headaches, burning eyes, asthma symptoms, stomach distress, nausea, dizziness, loss of mental concentration and muscle pain. Some individuals also suffer fever or even loss of consciousness. 
Motor skills and memory may be impaired. The sick practice calm abiding. They say to themselves, I feel so nauseous in my stomach. This means I'm alive. I am a living being that I can feel this and all these sensations and worries. And they breathe it in and they feel good to be a living being. When someone wearing perfume lies down next to me in yoga class, I get up and move. When someone sits beside me in a theater wearing perfume, I get up and move. When someone sits at the next table wearing perfume, I get up and move. When a student comes to class wearing perfume, my nose runs, my eyes tear, and I start sneezing. There's nowhere to move to, and I don't know what to do. When the sick rule the world, perfume will be outlawed. Dealers will stand in alleyways selling contraband, Estelada, and Chanel Number no. 5. They will carry tiny capsules of perfume in their mouths, tucked along their gums. And when they open their mouths, they'll look like vampires with their extra row of liquid gold teeth. Later in the restroom, I long to snap a picture of bandana Doty with my iPhone so I can show it to Kevin and we can share a laugh. But I can't get myself to even peek in the mirror at my round, bound, makeupless face. I do my toilet business with my eyes cast down at the stone tiled floor. At the end of Todd Haynes' movie Safe, when sick Julianna Moore looks in the mirror and says, I love you, she looks great with her fluffy hair and her cheekbones, not like a bloated bandana monster. I imagine kids scaring one another at sleepovers. The bandana monster's coming to eat you. So I don't know what the sick saw as I sat in my chair during the sharing portion of the meeting and told them my symptoms. I've been tired and headachy with a chronic ADD-esque lack of focus. I've been having allergic reactions to everything. And if I eat the wrong things, I'm up with diarrhea, dry heaves, and god-awful nausea for like seven hours. The sick sympathize with my symptoms. They suggest I carry Alka-Seltzer Gold with me. That Alka-Seltzer Gold will stop an allergic reaction dead in its tracks. I tell them my young, blonde, childlike naturopath thinks I have a problem with my phase two detoxification. And one sick guy, and the one sick guy in the group says they all have that, an overactive phase one detox and underactive phase two. The sick rinse their bodies with vinegar and dry off with a blow dryer to prevent mold growth. The sick travel and use cars, which they sell to one another. Cars that have never been detailed, that have been aired out and cleared with activated carbon, felt blankets, and zeolite. Behind their used cars, the sick pull teardrop-shaped trailers made from steel and non-fragrant wool, or vintage bullet-shaped trailers made from steel and porcelain. The sick will create new families based not on blood, but affinity of symptoms. The sick will travel in packs, commandeering porcelain lined, fragrance free buses. The well will no longer delete the email of the sick. When the sick rule the world, hotel rooms will be obsolete, airplanes will be obsolete, new cars will be obsolete. All existing new cars will be remaindered and shipped to Cuba. When the, ship, when, when the sick rule the world, fragrance-free auto shops will keep the old cars running smoothly. All service stations will be full service, the well filling the tanks for the sick. Mechanics and gas jockeys who do not wear gas masks will soon themselves become sick. The sick refer to people who do not wear gas masks as breathers. The rest of the meeting is about the dangers of cell phone towers. Christy, our guest speaker, tells us that electromagnetic fields, EMFs for short, are slowly destroying us all. Christy, a middle-aged, fleshy woman with shoulder-length straight brown hair and bangs, 
learned about EMFs in a weekend seminar she attended in Encinitas. Symptoms of EMFs exposure include dermatitis, burning pins and needle sensations all over the body, pressure or heaviness in the head, arrhythmia, high blood pressure, migraines, insomnia, profound malaise, blurred vision, nausea, tinnitus, tiredness, exhaustion, loss of concentration, loss of appetite, mood swings, tearfulness of eyes, pupil dilation, perspiration, muscular weakness, speech difficulty, convulsions, and unconsciousness. Christy warns everyone to disable the wireless in their computers and to keep their cell phones turned off as far and as far from their bodies as possible. A microwave cooks your oven, she says, but mobile phones fry your brain. EMFs can lead to cancer, ADD, Parkinson's, and even back pain. She passes out photos of camouflage cell phone towers, cell phone towers hidden in the cross of a church, a flagpole, clock tower, grain silo, water tower, palm tree, fake rock, and cactus. The fake rock and the cactus have trap doors, which are photographed open, revealing electrical guts. They look like movie props, but this isn't a movie. This is real life, Christy reminds us. Electromagnetic fields are lethal. During the presentation, I changed seats in order to get a better view. The woman I sit next to looks stunned and immediately gets up and moves across the room as far from the bandana monster as she can get. Christy passes around a swatch of cloth made from some kind of metal. It's a surprisingly soft mesh that she's using to make curtains to hang from her canopy bed to protect her from EMFs. You have to make sure the bed is completely enclosed, both above and below the mattress, as electromagnetic fields come through floors and ceilings. She gives us a handout listing where we can get the best deal for the mesh and other EMF supplies online. Christy also demonstrates a small box-like contraption protruding from its top is a two foot long antenna that's shaped like a mini Eiffel Tower. I wonder what's hidden in the real Eiffel Tower, what dangerous implements and rays. As Christy walks around the room, the contraption beeps whenever it detects an electromagnetic field. Cell phones make it beep like crazy. Wherever Christy goes, she checks for electromagnetic fields and thus she knows firsthand how perilous the world is. Sometimes she can't leave her home because of all the peril. When the sick who live nearby abscond with Christy to check for electromagnetic fields in their apartments, I rip off my bandanas and flee. Driving across the Golden Gate Bridge, I wonder, am I, am I one of them? I have been sniffed and found wanting. I gave that woman brain fog. Would anybody want to be one of them? But if I'm not one of them, what am I? What's going on with me? When the sick rule the world, Roses, gardenias, freesia, and other fragrant flowers will no longer be grown. On Valentine's Day, the sick will give one another dahlias and daisies to say I love you. The sick should have sex as often as possible because it's good for the immune system. The sick should lie on their backs and receive rather than deliver the fucking. When two sick bodies come together, their desperate hearts open it is lovely to watch them, the thin, iridescent haze of sickness flowing along their skin. When two sick bodies fuck, their hazy genitals sparkle and frizzle. The sick and the well should never mingle. The sick latch on to the genitals of the well like carnivorous plants, milking the well of their life force. But the well are too rich, too funky, neurotoxic deodorant off-gassing from pores. The sick's iridescent haze curdles, congealed 
Gurry bits clinging to sweaty torsos. The sick spasm was so little pleasure. Turn away sickened with remorse. Sick Bonnie is married to a rabbi. She has moved from house to house, but cannot find one she can tolerate. She used to sleep in the kitchen or outside when weather permitted, until the neighbors in the cul-de-sac began to spray pesticides. Now she and her young daughter sleep in her car parked at the end of the street. After looking at almost 200 trailers, sick Catherine bought a steel utility trailer with a camper shell to have shelter from the summer monsoons and winter storms. Although she does not see her three sons, she talks to them regularly on the telephone. Sick Rhonda and her husband are homeless and sleeping in their van, which is parked on five acres belonging to a sick friend. They have fashioned a makeshift shower outdoors. Rhonda's husband, a physical therapist, spends his days off renovating an old RV so they will have a place to live that is insulated from the elements and has indoor plumbing. A former psychologist, sick Nina, has been living in her van for three years. Homelessness is expensive. There is no place to cook and no place to rest which has made Nita even sicker. It is her passion to create a homeless shelter accessible to the sick. Sick Patrice used to work as a registered nurse at a treatment center for chemically dependent teenagers. She spent a couple of winters freezing on friends' screened-in porches. When she overstayed her welcome, she rented an apartment so she could have a bathroom to use though she still sleeps in her tent outside. Sick Tom worked as a counselor in public schools. For many months, he slept in the back of his truck because he could not tolerate being indoors. He finally found this airstream, but he cannot find a permanent place to park it. Sick Mary used to be a bodybuilder. She lives in a homemade tent in the desert with her sick baby. The desert will soon be leveled for a golf course, making Mary and her baby homeless. Sex partners of the sick must wash their hands carefully before sex and avoid touching the genitals with a hand that has had contact with the anal area. For lubricants, synthetics may be a problem. Experiment with butter or vegetable oils made from foods the sick are not sensitive to. Incense and perfumes cannot be used to set the mood, but good music, videos, or other approaches can work. Organic cotton bedding can reduce coughing and other less romantic symptoms. Muscle spasms and cramps from pesticides exposure can be immediate or delayed by as much as three days up to six weeks. If fatigue or pain are problems, the sick should remain passive and their partners should assume the positions that require the most energy. Fresh air and improved environmental controls will help the sick gain vigor. Be creative, patient, and persistent. The sick must always empty their bladders shortly after sex. The sick should never be kissed on the lips, as lip kissing transmits bacteria and viruses. There is no such thing as a hypochondriac. There are only doctors who cannot figure out what is wrong with you. When we eat in a restaurant, we take in the energy of those who cook and serve it, and their energy is bad energy. When the sick rule the world, there will be no restaurants. When the sick rule the world, Calvin Kine will design aluminum foil window dressings, and our porcelain law walls will be decorated by Limoges. Gas masks will be sexy, the envy of every Paris runway. Sick Mark, a former video maker, has lived in his car for 11 years. Indoor air is a chemical soup he reacts adversely to. His most frequent reactions are blinding headaches, a nasty metallic taste, tingly face, hoarseness, difficulty breathing, burning lungs and stinging eyes. Less frequent but much more serious reactions are throat closure, asthma, 
chest pains, dizziness, and disorientation. Mark's car is 22 years old and long ago has lost its new car smell. It's Christmas morning and Mark is sitting in his car in a park. The park for the time being is safe. This could change at any moment with a shifting breeze, bringing with it whiffs of industry, detergent, fabric softener, fertilizers, pesticides, herbicides, wood burning or synthetic logs, exhaust from cars, buses, and trucks. When an air problem suddenly arises, Mark drives his car to a different area. Mark drives 2,000 to 3,000 miles per month trying to find a safe spot. Wary of money, the sick use credit cards whenever possible. Upon returning home, they empty their pockets of any coins or bills they have accumulated and immerse them in a bowl of zeolite crystals, which absorb dangerous residues. Placing the crystals outside in the sun will recharge them. When the sick rule the world, the well will be servants, and all the well will try to become sick so they too can have servants. Pretending to be sick will be a capital offense. When the sick rule the world, the limbs of the well will be chopped off in the middle of the night. The well one still alive, flailing and screaming. The limbs of the well will fetch exorbitant fees on the black market, sold to sorcerers who will dry the limbs and grind them into magic powders to be placed into ambulance to ward off blindness and toxins. These ambulance will bring prosperity to their owners. On her all metal bed and organic cotton blanket, sick Elizabeth lies absolutely still, cradled in the impermeable membrane of her galvanized steel shed. The thin blue filtered air cools her inflamed lungs. The sheen of the porcelain walls and ceiling reflects her image back to her. The clear silky arms of her ghost selves reach out and caress her. You are totally alone, they sing in an eerie, high-pitched wail. They remind her of Anthony and the Johnsons, but at a whisper. Twin yellow bulbs screw into the ceiling like glowing yolks, she thinks, like God's testicles. Her naughtiness makes her smirk. She misses curtains and cushions, but she's grown used to the sheets of aluminum foil taped over the windows the total lack of ornamentation. It gives her eyes a rest, an unbroken meditative line. She falls asleep and dreams a bandana monster is chasing her into an ever receding horizon. When she awakens, her ghost selves beckon, join us. She tries to ignore them, tries not to think of the organic rope in a Ziploc bag hidden beneath her bed. With an organic rope, hanging is totally non-toxic. Elizabeth, you don't have to be alone, her ghost self sing. We're waiting for you. But I'm happy, she counters, living inside my little porcelain house. It's cute as a teacup. I'm happy as a pinafore mouse living in a teacup. When the sick rule the world, mortality will be sexy. When the sick rule the world, all writing will be short and succinct. No paragraphs will be longer than two sentences, so we can comprehend them through the brain fog that well bring to us daily. Thank you. I'm now going to give you a brief introduction to the films and we can begin the screening. Tonight's film program brings together three short pieces. The first is the aforementioned um, excerpt from Gilles Deleuze and Claire Parnez A to Z, and specifically the letter M as in malady. I'll add as an additional note that Hedy translated and subtitled this whole documentary um, for it to be made available through semiotext. In her eloquent program notes, Chris Krauss explains that the films Hetty has selected to be a companion to this excerpt, quote, function as narrative backstory to Deleuze and Parnay's philosophical poetry. 
And later, she also stresses an aspect of the clip in which Deleuze talks about the clarity that unwellness can sometimes offer. And she says, quote, fragility favors literary work and philosophy. So this first segment is 29 minutes. The second film is L'Ordre, um, which was made in 1973 by French director Jean-Daniel Paulet. It's an experimental essay film, which was actually commissioned by Cinémathèque Sandoz, a film production company founded by the pharmaceutical company Sandoz, as part of their series of films that they were commissioning for interdisciplinary research purposes. And it's quite surprising to think of this rhythmic and lyrical film as a tool for research, but it does in fact provide a really intimate and very subjective view into life um, on the leopard colony of Spinalonga, an island off of Crete, through the eyes of an inhabitant whose name is Raimondakis. And so that film is 44 minutes. And finally, the third film in the series or in our screening tonight is The House is Black, which was made in 1963. It's the only film ever made by Iranian poet uh, Farooq Farooqzad. Similarly, it's a video essay set in a leper colony, though this time in Northern Iran. And it overlays images with a mix of poetry, religious text, and um, a very clinical description of leprosy. So this film is 22 minutes, and thank you so much for joining us this evening. We'll now begin the screening. <laughs> 